We've got a book out on that, The Seven Days That Divide the World. How do you reconcile the description you find in the book of Genesis with what you know as a scientist? Well, you'd be amused to know, and I must confess it, Simon, that I come from the city in Northern Ireland called Armagh, where Archbishop Usher was, who calculated the date of creation uh, as 4004 BC. And you will remember that he said he reckoned that Adam was created about nine o'clock in the morning, but he apologized in a letter to Cambridge's vice chancellor that he couldn't be more accurate than that. So yeah, well, what do you do the, with that? What do I do with it? Well, we start with in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then there is a sequence of six days, and each of them begins with the phrase, and God said, and God said, and God said. And then after those six days of creation activity, God rests on the seventh day. Okay. Now, just looking at that, the first thing to notice is there is a literary pattern. One would logically conclude, I think, prima facie, that day one begins with, and God said. And that means that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth is not talking about day one, but is prior to day one. Now, instantly, you see, that removes the difficulty with people saying that the Bible insists the earth is young. The Bible doesn't insist the earth is young. It says in the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. It doesn't say what that time that was at, and then it gives a sequence of creative acts of God, which we can discuss separately. And interestingly enough, when you check with the Hebrew scholars, they tell you that the tense changes from verses 1 and 2 to verse 3, and the tense that's used in verse 1 and 2 is normally the tense used to describe something that happens prior to the sequence that's following. So there's corroboration from both logic and grammar that perhaps this text is a little bit more sophisticated than people think it is. So you would take the approach then that there's a lot more going on in this text, that yes. literally, so, so uh, from a literary basis, yes. which would indicate that it doesn't demand uh, a literal six days. Well, we have to look at this word literal, you know. Think of this statement. Jesus said, I am the door. Well, we don't understand that to mean that he was a door made of wood or metal or plastic. It's because of our experience of doors made of wood, metal and plastic, though, that we know it's meant at a metaphorical level. But careful, because the metaphor is a metaphor for something real. Jesus is a real door, not a literal door. Or you might say he is a literal door at a different level. That's why I find the word literal actually a bit unfortunate, and it's why many people use the word literalistic to describe that absolutely basic sort of literal level. Re the the, the, that's right, you see. Now, pursuing that, I would want to argue that the word day in Genesis 1 and 2 has four different meanings, and all of them are literal. Do you want me to prove that to sure. you? Well, take the first. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. How long is that? Well, it's certainly not 24 hours because the text is drawing your attention to the distinction between day and night. So that's the first meaning. It's the hours of daylight, roughly 12 at the equator. Okay, come to the next one. And there was evening and morning one day. Now, I know scholars discuss that a little bit, but it seems the consensus is generally that this is the Hebrew way of describing a full 24-hour period, okay? So that's meaning number two. Then we read God rested on the seventh day, but there's no formula, and there was evening and morning day seven. Now, that's interesting, as Augustine pointed out centuries ago. And if you ask people theologically what that means, there was a sequence of creative acts and God rested. When did he start creating again? He didn't. The rest is still going on. So that absence of the formula actually opens up a possibility into a theological dimension. So that's three meanings. Then you come to chapter 2 and the end of that first uh, section of Genesis where it says, um, when God created the heavens and the earth. But actually the word when, and that's the, I think the ESV translation, it's actually in the day God created. Now, that doesn't mean Tuesday or Monday or the first or all. 
No, it means when. Just as if I said to you in my young day at Cambridge, we had to wear gowns after dark. You wouldn't say, do you mean Sunday or Tuesday? No, it means that a particular period of time. Now, here's a compressed text, Simon. It uses the word day quite often. It uses it with arguably four different meanings. And that's an indicator to me that here we must be very careful before we jump to conclusions. It opens up more logical possibilities. The idea would then possibly be that God speaks day one, let there be light. And then that settles down and then God speaks again. When does he speak again? Well, presumably after the first time. But it seems to me that Scripture allows the possibility that there's an enormous space between the days. That is, they are the point, so to speak, where God inputs a new level of energy and information. Now, the interesting thing about that is that that would mean that so far as any evidence was left in the scientific investigation of the universe, we might expect to find the sudden appearance of new levels of complexity, which is what we do find. And I personally see no compromise with the authority of Scripture on this, but it is a big subject and one needs to have much more time to unpack it.